have the seed potato program. And today we thought we'd just let Christine kind of explain what she does, how do we, how we have a seed program and how it works around the, the farm we have here with 400 acres, things move around. And Christine is the person that does all things potato. So with that, uh, maybe a little bit about yourself, why we're standing out here in the potato patch and uh, just kind of tell people what we're doing, Christine. Yeah, absolutely. Um, my name's Christine. I've been in the valley a long, long time. I come from a family of farmers. Um, so I was really glad when this kind of opportunity came up. Um, I manage the potato seed program. It is a source of clean seed for the agricultural community. Um, in general, I keep potato varieties in a tissue culture lab. Um, where it's tested annually um, and then uh, for the for the certified growers I grow a controlled uh, seed and put that in a controlled greenhouse um, we're out here in the field today which is basically a security check for us it serves a lot of really great purposes um, in terms of the security check um, we get to plant all the 216 varieties that I maintain um, so that we can check and see how they do in, in natural conditions with uh, moisture pressure, weed pressure, um, and actual real soil. Um, and so I can, I can look at them, I can and, uh, get the characteristics of the varieties. Um, we can check for disease pressure just to you know, make sure that, uh, confirm the tests basically, that everything is clean. Um, and then I get a reservoir of tubers um, and I keep those and I can do data collection on them. Um, we can do trials to check out some of the characteristics of each of the varieties. Um, so, and, and then I, another important thing is this field is really our, our easily accessible public view of what the potato seed program is. So as you look over the field, you see sections of 25 tubers and then a space and then another variety of 25 tubers. So it's not really like a commercial field where you have, this is about 2.4 acres. So in a commercial field, you have close spacing, low number of varieties, um, but this is more like research. And so uh, it's, it's a great program, it's a lot of fun. And it, it, the important thing <clears throat> is that we supply clean seed to the producers in the state and then it goes out to the growers, the community gardens uh, and gardeners. So, so overview. So, so how many varieties do you have out here this year? This year I have 216 named and numbered varieties and then I have a few extra trials going on as well. Um, one of the interesting things about potato tubers is that the tuber that you plant to seed is basically a clone of the plant you pull it from. So the nice thing about that is you know exactly what you're gonna get the next year. Um, a lot of times you'll notice the flowers on top of the plants and then <clears throat> you'll get some seed balls. So the actual genetic recombination occurs in those seed balls. So I also take those, they're called true potato seed, and um, I, I look through them and, and plant some if they look promising, and then we, we evaluate and see if there are any new varieties we wanna try. That's really good. So maybe um, I know that the University Extension has helps people out in their family gar and personal gardens with the family work they do. So why don't you just a uh, little bit talk about the life cycle of the potatoes, kind of how they've been growing this year. Uh, when is it time to harvest? What are people looking for? And uh, you know, like I said, you know, Ag Extension has some great uh, online stuff, but just a, a general overview of the life of a potato and you know, they're gonna, now that these are flowering, what does that mean? Sure, absolutely. So um, the potato seed, a tuber that you plant um, in general you put it about six inches deep when the plant reaches you know a foot or two in height you're going to bury all the way up to the very top leaves and then everything that's underground is going to develop tubers that you harvest to eat uh, in the fall so in general we get a 15 or 16 week season um, the flowering is an indication of, of kind of an end stage. You're getting close to harvest. 
So following this will be the onset of the seed balls and then you'll see the, the vines naturally start to senesce. And that's the indication that it's, it's really time to harvest. So even after the, the vines die back naturally, um, the, the tubers can stay in the field for a couple of weeks. They'll continue to size up and, and get more starch in the, in the tubers. And um, if you harvest just a few weeks after you see that, you'll get a, a real good high quality crop. So a lot of people say you have to wait for the freeze, you know, that comes along. So how important is it to let that plant die and leave it in the ground? Because I, I you know, I, I think that people don't realize that if you pull them out early, it, not necessarily the storage, uh, you know, what, what it, how does that matter to people? Yes, you can leave it in and it grows, but does it matter? I guess is my question. Okay. Well, what a freeze will do is it will get you a natural vine kill. Um, a lot of the varieties, uh, you know, with 216, you have an incredible range of maturity rates. Um, so some of them, like uh, Allagash and Yukon Gold, mature fairly quickly and early. They just need a short season. Uh, the later varieties will still be growing strong and the, the top of the plants will be fine. The tubers will be underdeveloped um, even when we get a freeze. So basically killing the vines manually will push the, the tubers into um, a, a more ready to harvest um, frame. So basically what happens when you kill the vine is that uh, they start to do a skin set. Um, I don't, if you've noticed when you harvest tubers, lots of times the skin just sloughs off really easy, but that skin is a protective barrier um, for for fungus, for bacteria, for any disease that they might um, experience while they're in storage. So giving them a chance to have a good solid skin set in the field will help minimize that. So how long can, you know, and, and how would you store them and how long can you, in, in, your, in your household, you know, plant someplace cool in the basement, how long can you keep potatoes? Well, with, with storage facilities, you can really keep them uh, through the entire winter easily. That's, that's how we maintain our seed stock. Um, what we do is we keep them at 38 degrees Fahrenheit with about 98% humidity. They'll last a very, very long time. It's a lot more difficult to do that uh, at, at, in a home, but if you have a dark, cool spot in your garage or in your crawl space, then that will do. You can keep them for several months. Um, like the um, harvest maturity levels, there's also a dormancy factor for the potatoes. So some of them will last longer than others. Um, Magic Myrna is a wonderful popular potato variety. It is famous for having a very short dormancy period, so it will sprout quickly. So knowing that you can kind of decide which varieties you want to eat first in a home, in a home environment. Um, I would say a very critical factor is to keep your potatoes in the dark. If they are in the light, they will start to green, uh, which indicates an increase of, of a glycoalkaloid called solanine, which can be toxic. You can get stomach ache and cramps and, and stuff like that. It's the same compound that's found in um, rhubarb leaves, which are known to be toxic. So if your potatoes are exposed to light, make sure you ca cut out any green neck sections and um, yeah, and uh, yeah, keep them in the dark. Uh, the other thing in, in light is they will sprout earlier. And so you don't so, want so that So I, I had a question the other day about true seed and whether they could <laughs> eat true seed. And I'm like, yeah, that's a good question. Not a good idea. Not so a good you... <laughs> idea. No, so. no, uh, don't eat true seed. Uh, the, the top of the plant, the leaves, the seed pieces are one of the areas on the potato plant that have high concentrations of, of solanine. So um, yeah, you don't want to eat those. If you are you know, interested in some potato breeding and you just want to have some fun, you can actually grind those up in a blender and you can plant them. Um, potatoes have a, a huge uh, genetic complex and so you're going to get a lovely variety of potatoes um, from those true seed pieces. So you know, we've talked about the different varieties and I know we've done some uh, some uh, french fry trials mm -hmm. in the past. Yeah. 
So can you kind of describe different varieties and maybe what is going to be better for mashed potatoes versus, mm -hmm. and I don't want, you know, I'm sorry if I'm putting you on the spot here, but you know, the different kinds for how you would just, you know, kind of prepare different things or as they're selecting for next year, uh, gee, I want to kind of do this with my potatoes, you know, kind of a, an outline of what you might do. Sure. Um, so each of the varieties really are uh, suited for various purposes. Um, in terms of French fries uh, or, or any processing, so chips or French fries, um, you're going to want a, uh, a potato tuber with low sugar concentration and high starch. Uh, in general, that tends to be russets. There are several whites that make great um, chipping or fry varieties. Um, so just knowing the characteristics of the variety is, is going to help quite a bit. Um, so in terms of, of mashed potatoes, uh, pretty much anything that doesn't uh, disintegrate on boiling is good for a mash. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see what else. Baking potatoes, again, that's going to be, have the same characteristics as a fried potato. Uh, high starch will give you that nice, dry, fluffy um, characteristics. Uh, in terms of stews or potato salad, you are actually exactly opposite of your fries. You're looking for a potato variety with a low starch content. So um, those ones will hold together after boiling. They'll, they'll last you know, in the fridge um, and, and make a really good potato salad for you. So I'm gonna try to figure out if I can get on live here and see if we have any questions. Uh, uh, I can tell you if there's any that come through. Oh, okay, all right. So I just was going to take a quick look. So uh, John here in the background is doing our filming. Some of you have seen John in some of our, our lives. So uh, is there, there anything that we, uh, we're missing on, on about potatoes? What, what, else, what else should people know about potatoes and, and how they grow? I mean, you know, people sometimes assume you can or can't grow in the different areas of the state or mm -hmm. is there any, any area issues? Uh, yeah, and, and, and related to that, you might tell about the traditional potatoes that you got all uh, the uh, viruses out of down in southeast, some of the traditional stuff. So that, mm -hmm. that's a great story of what you've been able to do for the tribal potatoes out of southeast. Okay, yeah, absolutely. Um, potatoes and Alaska are really a fantastic match. Um, potatoes are versatile, they're tough, they grow extraordinarily well here, and then they, they last through our winters. So it's a great food source, really high nutrition, um, a, an amazing source of potassium. Um, and, and so potatoes for a long, long time have been a staple in Alaskan agriculture, way much longer than they've, they've been commercially cultivated. Um, even 200 years ago uh, is, is an estimation um, that the, uh, the Southeast Indians in Alaska had traveled by canoe down to South America and brought certain varieties of potatoes back up and have been cultivating them there in, their, in the villages in Southeast. Um, we have two varieties. We have Maria's Clinket and we have Haida. Um, that, that we maintain and they are available. Um, you know, it'd be fabulous to, to have people with this, this cultural heritage um, looking for, for uh, clean seed stock of these varieties and, and they do contact us, but there's a lot of interest, just people who want a piece of this Alaska culture. And so um, these two varieties are wonderful. They've been genetically tested. They are very close to um, wild types. Uh, I think in Peru, but definitely in South America where the potato grows wild. Um, one of the difficulties, I guess, with potatoes is since you are planting a tuber seed piece and then you harvest it and you save some of it back and, and that's what you plant the following year and you harvest it again, you can get a buildup of vi viruses. There are a great many that affect potatoes <clears throat> and sadly potatoes are very, very susceptible to them. And so uh, in terms of, of having a source of clean seed at the Plant Materials Center, um, potatoes without any of these viruses is, is our highest priority actually. So if something comes in, um, we can test it. 
Um, I have a very rudimentary virus cleanup program. It's, it's still in the development stages. Um, if it's a high priority or they need a fast turnaround, um, there are several labs in the lower 48 that we can send it to and for a fairly substantial fee, um, they will clean it up as well. Um, so however, you know, however route uh, we take, um, having potatoes to, to sell and to provide to the public and the commercial growers um, that do not have pathogens or pests in, in the tuber seed pieces that they're planting is really important for the health of agriculture in the state all around. So, so you know, and, and, and I think it's really important to notice, note that, you know, one of the concerns we have is people in their local garden, in their personal plot, they're like, well, what is it gonna matter? Well, these diseases get moved around. So we really, really ask you to buy certified seed and put it in your local garden because the food stock that's in the store is not going to be that clean seed and we don't need those viruses and pathogens getting around. So um, in, in that vein, so they should move around their garden, they move with their pot. So how many years and kind of how, how, how would you recommend that people, you know, how far do you move, those kind of things, could mm -hmm. you know, talk about that uh, a little bit? Sure. Um, so honestly, in a, in a garden plot or in a field, I would recommend as long a, a period in between growing root crops as you can manage. Um, lots of times there are uh, space restrictions on that. Um, but there are several things that will build up in the soil, um, even growing a potato crop or potato followed by carrots and beets and and stuff like that, you will start to see disease pressure. Um, I would say the minimum, if you can manage it, would be a three-year rotation cycle. Um, in addition, I would also recommend um, planting brassicas in the plot you're gonna follow with a potato crop. So that'll be your, your broccoli, your cabbage, um, Brussels sprouts, um, if you're, you have a large field, um, uh, there are some seeds that, that uh, mustard seeds that, that would be a good um, crop to plant before a potato crop. So why do you plant that type of a crop in front of the potatoes? What is that doing for the soil? Is it just helping clean it or nutrients or a little of all of the above? Uh, th no, this is just mostly a clean. Um, I was thinking primarily of scab which is incredibly common in every agricultural area in the world. And we do definitely have it here in Alaska. It loves our cool soils. It, it, it is everywhere pretty much that, that you plant potatoes. So those kinds of brassica crops seem to reduce the concentration of, of the scab bacteria in the soil. Okay, so so that really you know that that's the kind of thing is like people always ask why and I'm I'm an economist <laughs> not not an agronomist or a microbiologist and so it's really cool when we give that simple look this is going to help have the healthier soil right mm -hmm. so I know that a lot of people are talking you know we want to be responsible and minimize our fertilizers and our you know our chemicals that we put out there this is what we're talking about this is how you do good agricultural practices so you can avoid having to go in and use more chemicals and use more things like that. So, you know, this is why with starting out with clean seed, you don't, you, you got a running start, right? So you're not starting yes. out with a diseased product that you, then you're chasing. And you know, with the last year, I, I don't know if people know, I signed a restriction, a quarantine on seed potatoes that said, if you're shipping something into the state of Alaska, you have to meet our local producers criteria because there is so much disease in the lower 48 now that they were not meeting our requirements up here and we're you know we have clean soil clean water clean air and christine will give you clean seed it is the perfect opportunity for the seed industry and that's on a national level that's on an international level montana and alaska are the only two states that can sell seed in the pacific ramp you know, that is a pretty cool thing. And so we work really hard to promote our local industry. Christine is one of these people. That's why we can do that. And so this is, you know, a pretty exciting, uh, the tubers, I mean, we're outside today because it's just a beautiful day. 
you know, she has these little test tube babies. It is really a cool program that you run. You know, I don't know how to describe how cool it is the, the, the farm is that we that we have out here. Christine and I were talking, you know, this is probably one of the nicest job locations that we have in the state. We have people that work here that grew up here. They were raised here, they went outside to school. One of the really cool things is we have a lot of folks that are that are from here and take it to heart. So um, are there any kind of animal issues or bird issues or anything like that that with potatoes that people should uh, look out for? Uh, in general, potatoes are, are not sought after by moose. They will come wipe out everything else in your garden and often, you know, your potato plants will still be standing. So that is lovely. Um, actually, I had talked earlier about the glycoalkaloids. That is actually a defense mechanism against those kinds of herbivores. Um, so potatoes is honestly one of the safest most reliable crops that you can grow there there is some insect pressure uh, in terms of aphids um, and there's some cutworm issues sometimes um, rotating your crops and and um, being vigilant about watching for those will certainly help decrease that um, I, I also did want to uh, kind of promote the certified seed growers in the state of Alaska. There are a lot of Alaska-grown certified seed um, producers. They do incredibly good work and they're a great source for people who don't want to, you know, uh, buy, um, you know, commercially they don't want to grow for seed, they want to grow for themselves or to sell to eat. Um, there is a list of certified growers on our plant materials website at plants.alaska.gov and um, I, I just really strongly recommend them as a source of high quality um, Alaska grown certified potato seed. So one of the things that that has become real apparent in the pandemic is the fact that we're not growing enough of our own food. And so this year we've got um, roughly 500 acres of potatoes in. We could use 4,000. And so one of the things that we're trying to promote is our, our seed potato growers so that people can buy and grow more for the store. And I've been out talking to the distributors. If we can increase our supply, we can have more of the Alaska product in the stores and in our homes. And so, you know, this is one of those programs where it all starts. Yes. And so, you know, um, it is probably uh, one of our premier, uh, one of our oldest programs. And so, you know, we really want people to know that if you have questions, you've got the gardener groups, you've got the Ag Extension. And then if you're really, you know, got a commercial question, or you can't get an answer, we're here at the Plant Material Center and we're available to do those consultations when you can't get an answer from anybody else. So what are we missing, Christine? Have we, have we, have we missed any point that we should get across to people? Um, I, I think we covered the basics pretty well. Um, if there aren't any specific questions, then I, I'd say we're good. All right, well with that, this is another Thursday edition of our Facebook Live for the Division. Thank you guys all for joining in. We do put these on, uh, the recording online, so that you can see that. Like I said, um, you know, we are a service uh, division for the entire natural resource industry. So it is one of those things we're trying to let people know.